So um, what I'll be telling you about is a little bit of my dissertation work that I'm doing here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, with my advisors Eric Wilcox and Ellen Zweibel. And this particular piece is um, some work that I started with George Heald while at Astron as a summer student a few years ago. So um, just to start jumping into this idea of magnetic fields, I know by the end of the week we're going to be fully into magnetic fields, but a little bit of a warm up right now. Um, magnetic fields are really important components in galaxies. So here on the top left, we've got uh, the rotation measure map of the Milky Way galaxy. So you can see the line of sight magnetic field where the colors are darker. That's a stronger, or you've got more of a magnetic field component along the line of sight. Here, um, we know that uh, magnetic fields play important roles in the uh, acceleration of cosmic rays, the energy balance in the ISM, and that it can also play a role and is related to star formation. So in this top right here, we have the magnetic field, strength of the magnetic field as a function of the surface star formation rate in spiral galaxy NGC 6946. And so we can see that uh, there's a scaling relationship here, and we can also uh, when we observe magnetic fields, we see uh, several different components. So we can look at the, the total magnetic field when we look at the total non-thermal synchrotron emission. And then also when we look at the polarized synchrotron emission, we can get a sense of the um, uh, plane of sky larger coherent magnetic field. And then when we look at nearby galaxies, we can see these large scale structures in the magnetic fields. Um, for example, this is an edge on disk galaxy where we've got coherent structures coming out of the disk. Um, and when we measure these components, the regular field has uh, magnetic field strengths on the order of a few microgauss, and they can be coherent from hundreds of parsecs to a few kiloparsecs. Whereas when we look at the smaller, the turbulent scale, or turbulent magnetic fields, um, it can have more energy, uh, stronger, uh, few to tens of microgauss in strength, uh, but coherent on much smaller scale lengths from subparsecs to hundreds of parsecs. So just a review of how we can get this information. Um, most of it, as I mentioned before, comes from synchrotron emission, non-thermal um, radio emission. This gives us a sense of the plane of sky magnetic field. Um, if we look at in the infrared and submillimeter, we can also get, a get an idea of the plane of sky magnetic field with polarized dust emission. Um, a really powerful tool for measuring magnetic field is the Zeeman effect, which is due to hyperfine splitting, st hyperfine structure splitting, uh, when you have a line of sight magnetic field. Um, this is, I would say this is super powerful because you can get both the direction and the magnetic field strength directly from um, the spectral line information. Uh, and then another important way to get the line of sight magnetic field, because as you hopefully have been gathering, magnetic fields are three-dimensional in um, space. Uh, you can also get the line of sight magnetic field with Faraday rotation. So uh, if you measure the uh, polarization angle as a function of wavelength, as the, um, that linearly polarized light passes through a magnetized medium, it, the polarization angle will change as a function of frequency. And that shift is um, due to your magnetic field strength. So what do we know locally? Um, there's this great survey, Westerberg Singh survey done um, that looked at uh, 20 or so nearby spiral disk galaxies. And what they saw is that the magnetic field or the polarization um, in the disk is correlated strongly with the orientation of the spiral structure. So here you can see um, in the gray scale is uh, optical emission of spiral galaxy NGC 6946 and these um, Contours and vectors are showing the, uh, the direction of the magnetic field in the plane of sky. So you can see that the polarization is in between the optical spiral arms. Additionally, they found that this polarization peaks with the uh, approaching major axis of the galaxy. And so here, um, this lighter color is positive, darker is negative, and so you can see that the, the polarization strength is stronger with the approaching side. And uh, if we look at this, uh, if you bend it azimuthally, you'll see that the polarization peaks with the approaching uh, major axis. So this is, will, as I will show in a second, can be explained with the, as a geometrical effect. 
Um, they also saw a consistent occurrence of depolarization in the receding axis or in the, the receding minor <laughs> axis. And when they looked, they were using um, 18 to 20 centimeter observations. And so they thought that this is likely due to the emission that we're observing is only from the close side of the disk. And then the last observational trend that they saw was that there, there was a maximum in the Faraday depth, which is correlated with the minor axis of highly inclined galaxies. So if we go back to this first image here, so the Faraday depth would be max in these regions, um, and that's likely due to the plane of sky, again, a geometrical effect that we're seeing here. All right, so they came up with this model to describe these observational trends, and what they found was that an axisymmetric disk or spiral in the disk um, can explain this along with a quadrupolar halo structure in the magnetic field. So if you have a star forming uh, disk and then synchrotron emission in the uh, um, layers immediately around that, uh, you can get Faraday depolarization here, which would cause um, a decrease in your polarization that you would observe. And then on this side is where you're getting your um, that peak in polarization that we saw. So what I've been trying to do is to test this model um, with some additional observations. So what we're trying to do is to see if we can determine precisely what um, the source of depolarization is in um, the region where we don't see any polarization. And then also, can we constrain the the layers here, the depth of the layers? What information can we learn about the, the physical quantities here? So looking at NGC 6946, nearby spiral galaxy with an extended H1 uh, disk. It's slightly inclined at 38 degrees, moderate star formation. Um, some interesting H1 holes have been detected. So here we've got um, the optical emission. So this is tracing the um, optical arms here. And then here we've got UV, so we can see the, the young star formation going on. Um, up in the top right, this is a Faraday depth map. Um, I will come back to this shortly, but um, one thing that is very prominent is this gradient across the galaxy where you have more positive or stronger, more positive values up um, towards the north and uh, smaller approaching negative values in the southern regions. So what was known about this galaxy beforehand? Um, Reiner Beck did some great work earlier um, in 2007 and before, um, where he looked at uh, NGC 6946 at shorter wavelengths in addition to these longer wavelengths um, that were looked at with the Westerwork Sings. And so when you compare uh, the shorter wavelength observations in polarization to the longer wavelength observations, you can see that you start to recover some of that polarized emission in uh, that region of deep, that is strongly depolarized at longer wavelengths. Um, we can see multiple spiral arms in both, this is six centimeter up top and 20 centimeter down below. So you've got um, spiral arm structure. Again, um, it's in between your optical star forming regions, spiral arms. Um, total magnetic field strength, when you include all the non-thermal uh, emission, is 15 to 25 microgauss, but these ordered magnetic fields um, are on the order of about 10 microgauss when you look at these spiral arm, magnetic arm structures. So one possible way that you can get depolarization, and what I then go on to, to fit in a second, um, is with Faraday depolarization. So if you have an emitting and a rotating slab of a magnetized medium, so you're getting your polarized emission and your rotation in the same region, you can get um, a polarization spectrum um, that looks something like this, <clears throat> depending on the magnetic field structure. So this is uh, just a tracer for the uh, wavelength of observation versus your percent polarization here. And so one idea is that um, at the shorter wavelengths, you're up here in your polarization spectrum. And then if you have Faraday depolarization, so that um, emitting and rotating uh, region that is depolarizing your spectrum, then at middle way or like medium wavelength ranges, tens of centimeters, you might be in this re region, but then when you go to longer wavelengths, you're down here. So where I came in was using, oops, 
new 13 centimeter polarization observations. And so there are some interesting um, things that we can see just by looking at the polarization, uh, is that we start to recover this spiral arm that is observed at the shorter wavelengths that disappears at the longer wavelengths here. Um, but then we're also getting similar structure at the 13 centimeter uh, as we get at the, the longer centimeter, or at the longer wavelength, so 20 centimeter here. Whereas we don't, we don't see the, that magnetic arm as prominently at the shorter wavelengths. So what the 13 centimeter, the new 13 centimeter observations are showing us is that, you know, we're sort of probing a region, we might be probing a region, um, a depth in a different region into the disk than <coughs> is being probed at six or 20 centimeters. So we're sort of bridging this um, depth gap between uh, previous observations. So what I've done is I fit Stokes, models of Stokes Q and U um, across the entire disk of the galaxy. So this is an example here, um, where here is Stokes Q and U in blue and green. And then down below, you can look at how the total polarization changes as a, a function of wavelength. And what we found is that the not worst fit for um, our models is it tends to be screened. So before I was talking about this um, emitting and rotating regions being combined, but it seems to be that um, when we look at the, the best models, uh, the, the models that are being fit the best, they tend to be screen models. So we've got a region of um, polarized emission uh, that is then um, passing through different screens of turbulent medium. Skip past that. And then uh, if we look at the rotation measure gradients here, um, we see that there's a stronger gradient in the rotation measure distribution at shorter wavelengths compared to longer wavelengths. Uh, we've tried to fit uh, very simple estimates of the Braun model to this to explain this gradient. Um, but unfortunately, we need to do a, a more in-depth rate of transfer to really get at that. But we can explain this uh, gradient in rotation measure with the previous model. So I'll leave this picture up here for the results. It seems to be that we are, the, all of our, road, our polarized emission is coming from a thin layer uh, near the disk of star formation, but our 20 centimeter emission is probably probing, it, these um, cosmic ray electrons are getting a little bit higher and they're probing slightly different uh, magnetic fields uh, than both the 13 or three centimeter emission. But you know, with um, additional wavelength coverage and also a more in-depth uh, modeling of this Braun um, uh, effect, then we, we hope to be able to constrain the depths and possibly the opening angles of a helical magnetic field in this galaxy. Thank you. Hi, Anna. Uh, so your modeling of depolarization, um, you were looking at pretty highly depolarized gas, right, with P less than a half or so? Yes. Um, and is that a burn model that, the red line, is that a burn model? So this one is actually one of the um, screen models. Okay. So this is taken from this region in here. Um, okay. Yeah. So I was just wondering about if you've checked the um, models like the triple, Model which are much uh, which predict a much less a much more shallow fall off of polarized intensity than uh, than the burn model does particularly when that p over i is less than about a half. Right. So this um, this top one this modified PIF s is actually the Jamie Farns model that uses a um, turbulent medium at the source of the emission or near the source of the emission and that also can produce a more gradual fall off as well. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so that has been, we've included one of our models similar to that, so, yeah. Thank you. Uh, with this asymmetry, uh, the model of Brown uh, and, and, well, George Hilt and others, it, it relies very heavily on the point quadrupole at the center of the galaxy. Yeah. In fact, it's utterly unrealistic. No galaxy has a point quadrupole in its center. And if you relax this assumption, 
the explanation fails. Okay. Have you considered other magnetic field configurations to explain it, which solve any equations, not just taking from thin air? So um, at this point, we were we were trying to test this particular interpretation, and no, we, ha so we haven't. Maybe, I'm, yeah. I'm really sorry, I don't want to be rude, but maybe it's not worth doing. Oh. There are no point quadruples in the centers of any galaxies. It's utterly unrealistic. Okay. I discussed it with George and, yeah. and Robert. Okay. Talk to them. They agreed. Well, I, I would like and to also see a Beck, more. Who are um, over the three authors, it. right? Oh, so I'm sorry. I can be loud enough, but this is better. Um, could you have like a large scale galactic outflow that's stretching magnetic fields, which might be able to explain the kind of poloidal part in the middle of that first slide that you showed? Right. And so one other thing that um, in uh, when we were looking at oops, going toward going the wrong direction, we were looking at these RM gradients. We were wondering if we could possibly fit more of a helical magnetic field, and so. Um, by looking at this gradient, maybe there's a change in the opening angle um, also that we might be able to fit with um, more details. But yes, I think that more likely we, want, we would be looking towards a helical field toward using that galactic outflow idea as well. One last question over here. Oh, yeah, go for it. <laughs> there's a structure that's pretty clear in the Milky Way, which maybe is what you're referring to as helical, but it's it's coming from, it's poloidal and it's from the south to the north and it's opening like that. Mm -hmm. So you could just try using that function that you know with the with new opening angle uh, as a function of radius parameters. Did, but you haven't tried that. No, that would that that would be a great thing. To but I just want to say it's it's different from an outflow because it's ordered. But as far as I can try to mentally un untangle from this, it could be a much better fit for getting the asymmetry. Okay, great, thank you. All right, let's thank Anna again.